Hey everyone, what's going on? Grante here, and welcome back to the show. Today uh, we have the final installment of Europe, the strange death of Europe, immigration, identity, and Islam. And as this is the final installment, I want to first of all say thank you to you guys if you've made it through the entire series. I hope that you got something, a bit of perspective out of this book, because I know that I did. A couple other things I want to lead into this afterword of the book is two shockers. The first of which is in especially the first 10 minutes of this chapter, there are some gruesome details. There are death scenes, um, which will be described. If that is yours, then close your ear balls and fast forward through these ones. The second one is uh, something that you probably won't find to be much of a shocker, and that is we're going to look at the depth of the media's deception of the entire crisis. And though this book is not specifically about it, we can draw parallels to the media deception occurring in other countries, <clears throat> the United States of America. Um, I hope that you guys see the parallels here and maybe start some conversation below. Third, and finally, I want to say, again, thanks to all of you for being a part of this journey. Um, I've really enjoyed season 10 of my audiobook series, and I already have another book for season 11. I'm always open to your guys' suggestions, so if you've got a book you really want to hear, or you think would be great to have as an audiobook series on my channel, then sing out, and I'll make it happen. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, and bell. And uh, let's get into the afterword of The Strange Death of Europe. This video is part of an audiobook series featuring Europe, The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, and Islam by Douglas Murray in 2017. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or check out my website for downloads. Afterward, The Strange Death of Europe came out in the UK on the 4th of May 2017. Six weeks earlier, on the 22nd of March, a 52-year-old British-born convert to Islam, Khalid Masood, plowed his car across Westminster Bridge, killing an American tourist, a Romanian tourist, and two British nationals. Dozens more were injured as they scattered from the car's trajectory, some falling into the River Thames below. Crashing into the railings of the Houses of Parliament, Masood then ran out of the hired vehicle and through the front gates of the British Parliament. There, he stabbed to death one of the policemen on duty, PC Keith Palmer, before himself being shot and killed by armed police. Masood's last phone messages revealed that he believed he was waging jihad. In the immediate aftermath, the British press fell back on the routine cliches. In a much forwarded piece, one prominent British journalist took to the pages of the New York Times to insist that by the morning after the attack, quote, London was, if not quite back to normal, then certainly back in business. As I traveled through the south of the city, up to Chelsea, and later over to King's Cross, Londoners really were going about their lives as on any other day. He went on, this behavior reflects something deeper than social and conscious defiance, I think. It would simply not occur to the 1.8 million citizens of this megalopolis to allow one man to send them into hiding. As they say in the East End, you're having a laugh, aren't you? End quote. One wonders when the author last went into the East End of London and found a pub filled with cockneys uttering such phrases. Perhaps they were singing Roll Out the Barrel as well. Two weeks after the Westminster attack, in before P.C. Palmer's funeral, there was a national service of hope at Westminster Abbey, just across the street from where the policeman had been stabbed to death. In his sermon at the interfaith service, the dean of Westminster, the very Reverend John Hall, spoke for a nation that he described as bewildered. He said, quote, What could possibly motivate a man to hire a car and take it from Birmingham to Brighton to London, and then drive it fast at people he had never met, couldn't possibly know, against whom he had no personal grudge, no reason to hate them, and then run at the gates of the Palace of Westminster to cause another death. It seems likely that we shall never know. End quote. More bewildering events swiftly followed. On May 22nd, thousands of young women were leaving a concert by the American pop singer Ariana Grande at Manchester Arena. Waiting for them as they streamed out was Salman Abedi, a 22-year-old whose Libyan parents had arrived in the UK in the 90s after fleeing the Gaddafi regime. In the foyer, Abedi detonated a bomb he was carrying which was packed with nuts and bolts and other shrapnel. 22 people, children and parents, were killed instantly. 
Hundreds more were injured, and many suffered life-changing injuries. ISIS claimed Abadi as one of their soldiers. In the wake of Manchester, there was a twist on the new European tradition of featuring John Lennon's Imagine after any terrorist attack. You know the phrase, the words, imagine there's no countries, it isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. A Mancunian take on this developed when members of the crowd at a memorial shortly after the attack sang the 1990s Oasis hit, Don't Look Back in Anger. This seemed to perfectly fit the mood that politicians and press wished to encourage. Soon, the stories of the dead and the maimed disappeared. Broadcasters didn't seem to wish to focus on young women having bits of nails and bolts pulled from their heads and spines. Instead, within a little over 24 hours of the attack, the main theme of the response to Manchester was, don't look back in anger. Almost nobody said, why not? Why shouldn't people look back in anger when their daughters have been blown up just because they went to see their favorite pop singer on a Monday evening? Why shouldn't people be angry that the young Abadi killed 22 people, one for each year of life their country had given him? A fortnight after the attack in Manchester, Ariana Grande returned to the city and with a lineup of other pop stars, including Justin Bieber, performed a One Love concert. There was observation of the tragedy, and then the party started and people began to enjoy themselves again. Several observers lauded this as a demonstration of resilience in the face of terror. Few noted that, as with the previous month's Service of Hope, the dead still hadn't been buried before everyone else moved on. In what began to seem a remorseless sense of events, the night before the One Love concert in Manchester, it was London's turn again. On the evening of Saturday, the 3rd of June, three men drove a van into pedestrians as they crossed the London Bridge. They then leapt out of the van and began slashing at the throats and bodies of pedestrians, appearing to target women in particular. Then they ran, slashing at the crowds of tourists and Londoners alike, through the pubs and streets of Borough Market. Among their shouts was, this is for Allah. Eight people were killed, many more seriously injured, before armed police shot the three men dead. They were later identified as Yusuf Zagba, 22, Kurum Boot, 27, and Rashid Raduan, 30. Both Zagba and Radun had been born in Morocco. A subsequent inquest heard that Radun had entered Britain using a false name, claiming to be Libyan, and was actually five years older than he pretended. He had been refused asylum under his false Libyan identity, exhausted his further appeals, absconded, and lived under a Moroccan identity instead. Karam Butt, meanwhile, had been born in Pakistan and was described as having arrived in the UK as a child refugee in 1998, his family having moved to the UK to claim asylum based on political oppression. In the aftermath of the killing spree, these men took part in, and while securing the area, Londoners who had been enjoying a night out were ordered to put their hands on their heads and exit the area single file, with armed police training guns on them in case of further attackers. Though the theme of London's resilience was constantly raised, the public that night looked more like a defeated people being marched into captivity than anything else. In the days that followed, even more protective barriers, walls, and bollards were put up around landmarks and vulnerable infrastructure points around Britain. A traditional cry of the open borders movement for years had been, build bridges, not walls. Such people should go to London today. By the end of 2017, all of London's bridges were covered in walls. Nevertheless, the theme of resilience before terror was stressed by the British PM, Theresa May, as well as other pol political leaders. Happening as it did on the eve of a general election, the Labour opposition managed to make some political capital out of these attacks by claiming that they were at least in part a result of police budget cuts. The Prime Minister announced on the steps of Downing Street that there had been too much tolerance of extremism in the UK, and that after this third attack, enough is enough. She did not elaborate on this, prom beyond promising to appoint a commissioner to look into the issue of extremism. Otherwise, the emphasis was to keep calm and carry on, blitz spirit, and much more. It was struck even more hollowly once again in September when, on the 15th of the month, Ahmad Hassan got on the London Underground's district line and left a bomb on a carriage during rush hour. The 18-year-old Iraqi turned out to have arrived in the UK illegally in 2015 and lived with foster parents since then. Indeed, he had built the bomb he took onto the morning rush hour train in his foster parents' home. Fortunately for the many school children and others on the tube, the detonator exploded without managing to ignite the device itself, 
leading to a stampede from the carriage and several dozen people with minor burns and other injuries, rather than dozens of corpses being taken away in body bags. Of course, there is no reason why Londoners should have much or any residual blitz spirit. As the 2011 census shows, the families of most people now in London weren't even in Britain at the time of the Blitz. There is no reason why people imbibe the memories of a previous generation just because they happen to inhabit the same bit of territory as those earlier people did. As if to emphasize the fact that Blitz spirit just isn't imbibed in the London water, in November of the year that all these terrorist attacks occurred, and many others were thwarted, in the UK, an event unfolded which was lingered over even less than the dead from the terrorist attacks. Early in the evening on, the, on Friday, the 24th of November, there were reports of shots having been fired at Oxford Circus Station. A crowd stampede ensued, with hundreds of people fleeing in terror through some of the busiest streets in London. Terrified pedestrians barricaded themselves inside major department stores. A singer and celebrity named Ollie Moores tweeted to his nearly 8 million followers that he was inside Selfridges. Quote, Fuck everyone, get out of Selfridges now. Gunshots. I'm inside. End quote. Even more unwisely, this police was followed with, quote, Really not sure what's happened. I'm in the back office, but people screaming and running towards the exits. End quote. The British police announced that they were, resp that they were responding to events as a terrorist incident. And on social media and in prominent papers online, stories emerged of a vehicle having plowed into pedestrians on Oxford Street, of blood and bodies everywhere. Within an hour, this all turned out to be nonsense. There had been no vehicle attack, no gunmen, no bodies, and no blood. It is true that 16 people had been injured, one seriously, but this had been in the stampede out of the Oxford Circus Station and surrounding area. There were reports that the whole incident had been sparked by a gang fight, but this too turned out to be untrue. The day after the incident, two men who feared that they might have been responsible for involuntarily causing the panic handed themselves into a police station, but were released shortly afterwards without charge. On the 26th of December, a similar incident occurred. Another stampede took place in Oxford Street when false reports of shots being fired caused Boxing Day shoppers to run screaming in panic into stores and down the adjoining streets. Of course, incidents like these, like similar panics after the November 2015 attacks in Paris, swiftly disappear from the news and nobody writes about them. They are passed over with embarrassment. Yet they suggest that the public are not as stoical as opinion writers and politicians like to claim. Rather, they are so jumpy that a minor disagreement can cause a mass stampede, and terrified celebrities and public alike start running from wholly imagined terrors. The only event around this time that bucked any of these trends came as a result of an attack near Finsbury Park Mosque on the 19th of June. That evening, Darren Osborne, a 47-year-old family of four from Cardiff, drove a van into crowds of people in the area of the mosque in the er nearby Muslim welfare house. One man, who had earlier collapsed, died at the scene and almost a dozen more were injured. There were a number of striking aspects to this attack. Most obviously, the fear that perhaps the much-vaunted backlash might in fact have become a reality. But most striking was that the condemnation which people were so keen to keep as precise and non-sweeping as possible after any and every Islamist attack was wholly absent here. In the aftermath of the attack near the mosque in Finsbury Park, Islamist organiza organizations and some mainstream media were allowed to spread the blame for the attack as widely as possible, against whole communities, against individuals who had nothing to do with the attack, who had and would never advocate against or for such a thing, and against any individual against whom the media had a grudge. Don't look back in anger was not a theme that was adopted very widely after the Finsbury Park attack. While we may all agree that most Muslims are law-abiding, decent citizens, the same presupposition presumption does not appear to be able to be leveled at the rest of the population, who are judged as though only one step away from a pogrom mode. Perhaps it is because of such different standards of presumption of innocence that movements such as the so-called identitarians have begun to spring up in Europe. It is too early to judge what such movements currently consist of, let alone where they might go. On everybody's mind is a fear that their ideas and actions could in time justify precisely the reaction against which they ostensibly sprang up. As it happened, when the first of 2017's attacks in the UK was taking place, I was trudging along one of the new border fences that had recently gone up in Central Europe. 
the flows of people had diminished, but the preparedness of the authorities was on a very different level to that in 2015. Guards at the Hungarian-Serbian border demonstrated the new drone camera technology they were using and described their round-the-clock efforts to keep the borders of their own country secure. Of course, no border would have, been, would have kept Khalid Massoud out. The Westminster Bridge attacker had been born in the UK. But the need for borders, or at least a workable and efficient asylum policy, continued to be a political battleground, like the streets of an increasing number of European cities. On the 7th of April, it was Stockholm's turn. That afternoon, a failed asylum seeker from Uzbekistan hijacked a truck and drove it into the crowds shopping on one of Sweden's busiest streets. Reports said that the driver seemed to be deliberately aiming the truck at families. Five people were killed and many more injured. The perpetrator had arrived in Sweden in 2014, claiming asylum, though the Swedish authorities swiftly found that he had no legitimate asylum claim. He was ordered to leave the country in late 2016, but had stayed. On the 17th of August, it was Spain's turn. 14 people were killed and more than 100 injured after Yunz Aboyabuk, a 22-year-old Moroccan, drove a van into the crowds walking down the sidewalk of the popular La Rambla in Barcelona. He killed another person as he attempted to steal their car to escape. The perpetrator turned out to be part of a terror cell, members of which later plowed a vehicle into pedestrians in nearby Cambrils, killing one woman and injuring six others. Other members of the cell had been killed the night before when they were preparing a bomb in the house in Alcanar. It was later reported that the cell had been planning for more spectacular attacks, including the blowing up of Antony Gaudi's masterpiece, the Sagrada Familia Cathedral. A month later, in a separate incident, anti-terrorist police stormed the cathedral, evacuated it, and shut down the entire surrounding area after reports of a suspicious van nearby. The day after the Barcelona attack, two Finnish women were stabbed to death and eight others injured by an attacker in Turku, Finland, shouting Allahu Akbar. The attacker, who had deliberately targeted women, again turned out to be from that largest contingent of recent migrants to Europe, a person who had no more right to be in Europe than anyone else in the world. Abderrahman Buani had arrived in Finland in 2016 under a false name, claiming to be a child refugee. He turned out to be a 22-year-old from the perfectly peaceful country of Morocco. Despite being denied asylum and adopting different false identities, he was not removed from the country. And so, another set of families, victims, had their lives changed forever. Yet, it appeared that little or nothing could be done to prevent such attacks. All that could be relied on was policing, intelligence, and the erection of ever more bollards in all European cities. About the larger issues, nobody seemed to want to get out ahead of the belligerent political consensus. In December of 2017, Dimitris Av Avramopoulos, the European Commissioner for Migration, Home Affairs, and Citizenship, summed up the ongoing policy of the political mainstream in an article titled, Europe's Migrants Are Here to Stay. Quote, it's time to face the truth, he insisted. We cannot and will never be able to stop migration. The EU has granted protection to more than 700,000 people last year. End quote. Something he argued that was not only a moral imperative, but also an economic and social imperative for our aging continent. He continues, quote, at the end of the day, we all need to be ready to accept migration, mobility, and diversity as the new norm and tailor our policies accordingly. The only way to make our asylum and migration policies future-proof is to collectively change our way of thinking first. Avramopoulos did recognize failures, however, acknowledging that, of course, a lot still remains to be done in the European Union. We need to deliver on our promises to evacuate thousands of migrants from Libya, either through resettlement or assisted voluntary return in the coming months, end quote. The Italian government soon after promised to rectify this failing in the EU's migration policy. That same month, for the first time, it began flying migrants from Libya to Rome, with the country's interior minister promising to bring another 10,000 people by plane in the coming year in order to save them from people traffickers. Marco Minetti even went to meet the first migrants to be flown in from Libya himself, announcing, quote, This is a historic moment because we have created the first humanitarian corridor to save migrants given refugee status by the UN from the clutches of criminals, end quote. 
In order to help the migrants avoid the treacherous crossings of the Mediterranean, the new policy was to get around the smuggling gangs by the EU doing their work for them, using airplanes instead of boats. In the year before this announcement, the Italian authorities had gained proof, through undercover work, that a number of NGOs were actively cooperating with the smuggling networks, arranging meeting points and times and even handing boats back to the networks. The Italian public responded to these discoveries with anger, but not surprise. Of course, Manetti and other Italian authorities claimed that their new scheme would allow only genuine refugees to arrive in Italy, but the track record of all European countries suggested that this, as with so much else, would prove to be a fantasy. Manetti boasted that migrants who should not be in Italy would be deported at a greater rate. But this is another claim that the publics of Europe have reason to be skeptical about. Indeed, figures released in the UK at the same time as Manetti's announcement revealed that only one in five lone child migrants who lie about their age in a bid to stay in the country are ever deported. A study by the National Forensic Agency in Sweden sought to discover the age of almost 8,000 people who had recently arrived in Sweden claiming to be child refugees. The checks, carried out in case there were doubts about their age, found that 6,600 of the 8,000 people tested were in fact over the age of 18. That's more than 82% lying. What will ever happen to them? And the answer is the same thing that happens with nearly everybody. They will stay. If the European authorities had been lax about who they let in, time and consequences of being this lax and thinking so little about the long-term consequences made itself felt in the ugliest ways. Above all, one irreversible fact kept asserting itself, that if you import the world's people, you also import the world's problems, with perhaps some new ones. Events that happened anywhere else in the world now had an impact inside Europe. In December of 2003, 17, the U.S. president announced that he was planning to move the U.S. embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Pundits and opponents of the president immediately warned that this would lead to an Arab street rising up. In fact, the Arab world remained remarkably quiet. At the Damascus Gate the Friday after the president's announcement, a disappointed BBC journalist admitted that there were more press gathered than there were protesters. But to the extent that the fabled Arab street did rise up, it rose up in Europe. In the wake of the pr president's announcement, crowds of Muslims gathered outside the American embassy in London and, among other things, chanted something saying, Jews, remember Kaibar, an army of Muhammad is returning. A chant which recalls the slaughter of the Jewish community near Medina by the armies of Muhammad in the 7th century. Hmm. In Amsterdam, a man with a P Palestinian flag and a kafia smashed in the windows of a kosher restaurant in the Jewish quarter of the city. Up in Sweden, things got even nastier. In Malmo, the crowds chanted, we're going to shoot the Jews, while in Gothenburg, a crowd of around 20 masked men attacked a local synagogue, hurling Molotov cocktails. The crowd of 20 to 30 young Jews inside the adjacent community center managed to escape unharmed. Two days later, two firebombs were found outside the Jewish burial chapel in Malmo. In Stockholm, as in Berlin, crowds burned the Star of David, David and a speaker called Jews apes and pigs. Promises of martyrdom were made. A spokesman for the remaining Jewish community in Malmo put it starkly, quote, You don't want to display the Star of David around your neck. It's the constant battle to live a normal life. End quote. Wow. In the year since this book was published, further details about the fateful decisions described have come to light. A journalist from De Velt relayed some of Merkel's reasoning in August of 2015, not least her fear that photographs would go around the world showing German border guards repelling migrants. Meanwhile, one former European government official had, has described the conversation at the emergency meeting in Brussels in October of 2015. He quotes Merkel, sighing, quote, Wir saufen ab. We are drowning. Going on, we are getting so many refugees from Austria today. Imagine tomorrow, end quote. She then apparently noted that she came from a country where they once had to live with walls and said that she did not want to have in her biography that she had built new walls. On the political level, the policies of the latest generation of European politicians began to have some expected consequences. In the Dutch elections in March, the reigning VVD, the Liberal Party, managed to remain the largest party, defying pre-election polls which predicted Geert Wilder's party to be the winner in the VVD coming second. 
a new party, the Forum for Democracy, ate into some of Wilder's support. But more striking was that as polling day approached, the VVD's campaign rhetoric became more and more indistinguishable from that of Wilder's. In one advert, published in the Dutch papers, Prime Minister Mark Root, who was campaigning for re-elections, warned immigrants to act normal or leave. Then in the days before the election, there was a remarkable standoff between the Turkish and the Dutch governments. A number of Turkish politicians, including ministers, were due to arrive in the Netherlands to campaign for a yes vote in the Turkish referendum designed to congregate further powers around President Erdogan. The Dutch authorities took a stand against Turkish politics campaigning in their country, forbidding the Turkish foreign minister's plane from even landing and expelling another Turkish minister from the country. The moment of perceived touch toughness w paid off, and Wilder's party became only the second largest in the Dutch parliament. In France the following month, Marine Le Pen managed to get down to the last two in the presidential race. The following month, she was beaten to the presidency by Emmanuel Macron, who had broken through an un unusual election season without even having the support or structure of one of the mainstream parties. Perhaps his opponent's chances had always been talked up. Perhaps he was just lucky to be facing a member of the Le Pen family in a popular vote. But the election of Macron suggested to some people that the whole landscape of European politics could perhaps remain with the status quo. Amid the celebrations, few people seem to keep in mind the long-term trajectory. In the presidential runoff in France in 2002, Marina Le Pen's father had managed to get only 17.8% of the vote. In 2017, his daughter managed to get 33.9%. The German elections in September silenced anyone who still thought that European centrist politics could continue as normal. Before the elections, even a centrist such as Merkel's interior minister, Thomas de Mazier, used the pages of Bild Zeitung to try to play the same game that the Dutch VD VVD had used to stay in power. Quote, We are not Burka, end quote, was one of the things he said, in a desperate hope of emulating the tactics and success of Prime Minister Root. Despite such efforts, September, 7, September 2017, two years before her fateful, after her fateful borders decision, was the month that the German electorate seriously humbled their chancellor. It was the worst result for her party since 1949. And although the CDU remained the largest party, the German electorate shook their nation's politics by making the four-year-old Alternative for Deutschland, AFD, into the third largest party in the Bundestag, with 94 seats. That is a party whose joint leader, Alexander Goland, declared an hour after the re results that he would, quote, hunt down the government, Mrs. Merkel, and get our country and people back, end quote. Merkel's sister party in Bavaria, the CSU, found the chancellor unwilling to accept their demands for a tougher line on immigration and, having suffered an electoral catastrophe of their own SPD, refused to go back into coalition with Merkel. When coalition talks failed in November, there was talk of another election, but nobody could see how it could turn up, as particularly different results. Finally, in February 2018, almost half a year after the election, the parties of the old Grand Coalition, or GroCo, agreed to come back together once more. The move left the AFD as the main opposition party to the German government. Amid much talk of the humiliation of Angela Merkel, there was little demonstration of any actual backtracking. The words were often there, of course, but as they had been so many times before. On the first anniversary of the Berlin marketplace attack, the Chancellor promised that she would guarantee safety for the German people. But these were hollow words. The attacker a year earlier had been a Tunisian asylum seeker, Neither Merkel nor any European leader had instituted any policy or system to ensure that such a person would not get in or stay in Europe. All they had done was continue providing opportunities for the bollard-making industry and made every Christmas market across Europe for the foreseeable future become an armed police and ring-fenced security nightmare. Mark Stein summed up the curiosity of all this by asking, quote, If three countries have to have unsightly security controls, why don't they have them around the national borders rather than around every single thing inside those borders, end quote. In a way even more striking than the German election was the shift that occurred next door in Austria the months after the election. The country's young former foreign minister, Sebastian Kurz, 
managed to ensure his Austrian People's Party became the largest party by making a stand on issues of immigration and integration in the run-up to the election. His party won 62 seats, and after a short period of negotiation, formed a government with the Freedom Party of Austria which had won 51 seats. The acceptance of a party generally termed far-right back into government in Austria attracted significant international attention. But the election proved two things. Firstly, that the Austrian public wanted a government that was tougher on immigration and issues of identity. Secondly, that at the political level it was possible for a mainstream party to bring in a non-mainstream party to help it govern. For the future of European politics, the Austrian election and coalition may be the most important of the post-2015 era so far. If this new arrangement works, it could provide an example for the political mainstream in the rest of Europe. If it goes even minimally wrong, it could prove a klaxon call. For their part, the Central and Eastern European states continued in their standoff with Berlin and Brussels. The Weisgrad group of four nations, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, and Slovakia, found some strength in numbers. Continuing to refuse migrant quotas or in any way to greenlight and retrospect or in the future the policies that had led to the catastrophe of 2015, Brussels became increasingly threatening. In December 2017, the European Commission announced that it was suing Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic at the European Court of Justice over their refusal to take in the migrants that Brussels and Berlin had invited. Sanctions and heavy fines were threatened down the line. Yet at the time of writing these, countries are holding out against the European Commission's threats. In conversations in these countries since the strange death of Europe came out, I have been struck by the number of officials who have brought my attention to the crunch that is at some point going to occur. Strong majorities of the public in these countries are in favor of membership in the EU, but strong majorities are also consistently in favor of their national government's attitudes of hostility toward the demands of over-migrants being made in, by Brussels. And they object to the bullying, saying something has got to give is not true. Often things just rub along badly for a very long time. But a commission which sought to unify rather than divide Europe would not seek to blackmail member states for refusing to pick up the tab for Berlin's mistakes, especially when Berlin has showed no significant remorse and every sign that those mistakes will remain unacknowledged. In essence, the Central and Eastern European states look at what is happening in Western Europe and do not want to become like them. They see demonstrations by residents of Malmo calling on the Swedish government to do more to prosecute the increasing number of rapes in the city. They see that on New Year's Eve in Berlin in 2017, the city has to arrange a safe zone for women by the Brandenburg Gate so that they might celebrate New Year's without the fear of rape. And they see the reports confirming what everybody knew but nobody would admit. In, July to, in January 2018, figures were released showing that the recent rise in violent crime in Germany had a particular cause. It was, as only officialdom in Germany would have been able to try to deny, because of the recent influx of migrants. Indeed, the study, which used data from Lower Saxony, showed that more than 90% of the rise in violent crime was attributed to young male migrants. Who would want these problems or tolerate them if they did not already have them? From the moment it was published in the UK, The Strange Death of Europe went into the bestseller lists. It remained in the Sunday Times' top 10 nonfiction bestsellers for almost 20 weeks and became one of the best-selling books of the year. For most authors, such an event would be an, an unmitigated joy. This was not the case in this occasion. I learned that the book had reached number one on the Sunday Times bestseller list while in France. At the same time, I began to receive calls from concerned friends and colleagues in London caught up in the terrorist attacks on London Bridge and Borough Market. The book was received well by the critics as well as by the public, but most striking was the number of politicians and serving and former political leaders who admitted to having read the book and admitted, what is more, to hardly agreeing with it. Indeed, the reception from high-ranking political leaders was such that it did make me several times wonder why, if there was such agreement, this had gone so wrong in the first place. All of it went to show what I had long suspected, which is that it is simply easier to let the status quo roll along and then complain about it than it is to take the short-term political hit for the long-term well-being of your society. 
The book was also well received by publics in other countries, especially the USA and Australia. In both of these countries, readers and politicians often said to me, it's about us, isn't it? And the answer to which is, yes, of course. I suppose it is inevitable in a book of this length that some errors will be found. After the hardback edition came out, I expected that several people would claim that the statistics and figures herein, factual, incorrect though they are, were in some way erroneous. I expected people to contest the numbers Europe has taken in, the numbers affected by the decisions, or the numbers expected in the years to come. I expected them to claim I had cherry-picked their speeches or even quoted out of context. Yet none of the many facts in this book were able to be refuted, and nobody of any consequence has ever tried to contest or deny them. The only minor individual mentioned in the book who I know to have objected to the descriptions of himself here is Jonathan Portes, one of the figures glancingly mentioned for his role in lubricating the open-door policies of the post-1997 UK Labour government, a policy that his superiors have long since expressed regret over. Via his social media outlet from his post at King's College London, Port has let it be known that the description of him and his involvement in that deeply damaging policy were riddled with errors. He neither contested the facts nor refuted the political disaster. Instead, he objected at his coupling with Sarah Spencer as an academic, stating that although he was in academia before that role, and although he has been in academia since that role, he was not in academia at the time. Secondly, he objected that rather than being noted for his views on immigration like Sarah Spencer, he, in fact, had never worked in immigration until the British government invited him to help formulate its stance on the matter. Accordingly, I withdraw my accusation that he is an academic of any kind or expert in these fields. The evidence of his work should have been enough. There are still people who try to pretend that all we are going through, and all that we are going to go through in the years ahead, is normal, or not going on. Only occasionally do the places which push this lie make any concession to the reality that the Europe European people see all around them. In November, the Pew Research Center released a striking new study which vindicated the claims made in this book and added more alarm for anyone who could cope with it. The study showed the extent to which Europe's Muslim population was due to increase, even without any massive upsurge in migration of the kind that had occurred in recent years. It also showed it in other scenarios so that, for instance, Sweden, with an 8% Muslim population in 2016, would have an 11% Muslim population in 2050 if there was no more migration at all. It would have a 21% Muslim population if there was a regular flow, and a 31% Muslim population if recent numbers were kept up. Even The Guardian in Britain covered this story under the headline, quote, Muslim populations in some EU countries could triple, report says, end quote. The paper's readers must have found this a shock. Before wondering why their favorite left-wing paper had by, it, had, by its own lights, become so inflammatorily racist. As this book suggests, there is an ongoing effort to make the European publics not believe the evidence of their own lives. The point of this book is in part to point out that there is no point in this pretense. There is no point in pretending that everything going on does not constitute the most significant change possible in a culture. Sweden, in 1950, was an ethnically homogenous society with almost no migration. A century on, it will look an almost entirely different place. And within the lifespans of so many of us, it is fair to say that such a country, like most other countries in Western Europe, will become unrecognizable even to fairly recent inhabitants. Perhaps it will all be fine. Perhaps the people who remember what Sweden was, what France was, what Britain was, and what the rest of Europe was, will just die out. Perhaps then all the problems, not least the problem of identifying the problem, will cease. Perhaps. Or perhaps a whole new world of problems is being born. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.